I guess because I'm up here, it sort of goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. This will be a little different from the other panels of things we've had thus far. Uh, I want to really have like a dialogue with you guys, because I'm sure, you know, as artists, you've all gone through this, you know, the age old conflict. How do you make a living at this? I mean, they touched on that in the past uh, discussion here about cartooning education. How do you make a living as a cartoonist or an artist or a just in general a creative person while remaining true to your artistic integrity, your artistic vision? Uh, you know, comic books especially you know, are this commercial medium. You look at the two leaders in the field, Marvel and DC, and they have product out there, what? At least every month? Are there any weekly comic books in I don't know. There's a couple of bi weekly. Okay, bi week. Yeah, so they have to, they keep promoting the product, you know, and it's out there to promote the movies. And it's out there to sell the McDonald's Happy Meals. So you got a lot of commerce there. Excellent. Did I miss it? No, you haven't missed it. My guest panelist is he's bringing back this lamp he has or something. Oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> This is like stand-up comedy. We're nothing without our props. <laughs> Did you bring the chicken? Did I bring the chicken? Yes. Oh, the rubber? The rubber. And the chicken. Yes, please. <laughs> it's on uh, the sun a while. I didn't say it like that. It's to, you know, stop. Uh, no, no, it's called shtick. You see, and that's what we do shtick. here. To, uh, very good. I'm going to put some of that in, too. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So we're not. Very good. What, what is it? Am I pronouncing this right? The feng shui? You have, to have, shui. you have to have the proper placement. I have no feng shui. Yeah. <laughs> Lost okay. or more, man. Okay. Uh, my feng shui. Now that my co panelist is here. Oh, it's not even here. It's a chair. Do you want me over there? Here. Fantastic. You're not going to believe this. What, about two months ago, we were. Minding your own business and getting in everybody's way at the Sitwell Coffee House in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, up by the University of Cincinnati. And uh, we were uh, throwing ideas back and forth, jamming out ideas for a mini comic, which maybe I dropped the ball, but <laughs> it's not available here today, but it should have been. Anyway, uh, in the midst of getting there, we were what, like a three, four hour session to this coffee house. We were right in the middle of drawing comics. We were like, really uh, made a test of ourselves. We started talking about things like what is art, what is talent, and I said, geez, this would make a good panel of space. And Brian, being in a good mood at the time, agreed with me. <laughs> is Brian still in a good mood? I hope Brian is in a great mood. Oh, okay. yes. yes. So I, I, my partner in crime, Brian Hagen, and I, Bruce Chrislett, and I guess a good way to start with this, because I want to you know, take it from art I mean, art, art. So let's just go around the room if we can. If you went to art school or college or anything, it's time for a little shout out. Bruce Chrysler, Bachelor of Fine Arts, Youngstown State University, 1978. Brian Hagen, uh, Bachelor of Arts, English Literature, Master's Journalism, cartoonist. Uh, Jonathan Riddle, uh, BA in Illustration, Columbus College of Art Design, 2007. Okay. <laughs> there you okay. Everyone else is shy. I, I got no letters after my name. Okay. <laughs> and you learn to, and, uh, and are cartooning or are? I am actually, uh, yeah, I came to this panel with sort of a, a, a different interest. In, in, well, I mean, not that I'm not interested in what you're saying, but right. my, 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 uh, my interest in what you're saying is how to approach, uh, I'm, I'm writing scripts, and I, I can see a page, but I can't, I can't cartoon, I can't draw. My interest is, in the business end of this, is how, how to approach that, like, I'm, I'm concerned with the, the fair way, the sort of moral way of, you know, not, I don't want to screw anybody over. Right. You know, as far as paying for art or being in business with an artist to produce a comic book. And, and that's what I'm looking to do, is to, is to find a, you know, a partner or multiple partners to produce, to produce these scripts I have in mind. Wow. Um, so I'm, 
you know, I'm, I don't know that I have questions yet, but I, I'm very interested in what you all have to say, uh, specifically on, on that. Well, you're, you're in luck because, you know, you've got a room full of artists there, you can see the styles you like. Indeed. And, and I think they would all be happy to hear that you want to give them a fair shake <laughs> <laughs> with the money and everything. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's just these the, the ideas I had here were things that I've been uh, grappling with at least since I was in college. You know, this whole idea, art versus commerce, and art versus comics. You know, uh, back then this is the Stone Age. I was in college back in the 1970s. Comics had a terrible reputation. Uh, I got to college and I found another guy who was also comics crazy and a cartoonist. And uh, we started a comic book club. And we started a comic book club because we had the idea of putting on a comic book convention. We couldn't find a student group to sponsor us, the art club. They just sneered at us. You know, back then, the comics, oh, that's trash. So then we went to the college fraternities. They said, oh, duh, comics are too mature. You know, can't win. Jeez. So anyway, we started this club. and. Uh, we had our first comic book convention in 1975, and we had what I think was the first academic conference on comics, put together by Joe Zabel. And I remember there was this English teacher that uh, gave a talk on, it was called From Little Nell to Little Orphan Annie, The Triumph of Illiteracy. Gives you an idea where things were. Then. But you know, since then, our profile has risen, and just seeing where we are, this whole idea of uh, being true to your artistic self and not selling out, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, who has sold out, who has not sold out, you know, in comics? Well, uh, the, well the gist of our, our, the seed of our argument yes. was, uh, and the comic itself, was I was, you were protesting against my idea of a cartoonist needs to promote themselves. A cartoonist needs to find. My, my character in the comic was again. I agree with that. And the person <laughs> I was arguing with in that particular day <laughs> was against uh, pro self promotion. Hey, devil's advocate, but kind of buddy. <laughs> I was deviling as well. Yeah. I admit. We were doing a lot of deviling that day. But they uh, couldn't get rid of us. But that was. But that was the point, it was the argument between, okay. it's like, are you compromising if you're actually listening to an audience and trying to respond to their right. Uh, right. That's true. needs, that's true. the feedback from their readers uh, well, uh, online that's coming immediately? That's very true. Uh, and you called me a big fat sellout and kicked me out of the comments. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> that's, ex that's exactly how it happened. And then we both got so mad, we set the coffee house on fire and that doesn't happen. No, he's kidding. But but seriously, that was the... Uh, we were throwing a lot of ideas back and forth, a lot of passionate arguments. And that was one of them, yeah. What is selling out? You know, uh, I can remember an old underground comic, Art Crumb, Robert Crumb. He's sitting there and there's a wastebasket by him with offers from all the big corporations. And there's a little arrow pointing to that and saying, Art Crumb does not sell out. Art Crumb does not sell out. That sounds great, doesn't it? Here's the reality of underground comics. When all those artists first moved to San Francisco, they all went on welfare. So you could say they were being subsidized by the United States government to publish underground comics. In fact, that's how Robert Crumb, Art Crumb, met Terry Zweigoff, the guy that later did the documentary Crumb. Zweigoff was Crumb's welfare caseworker. <laughs> wow. True, true story. True story. Next thing he knows, he's been drafted into the musical group, the Chief Suit Serenaders. But uh, Crumb told all the other underground cartoonists, hey, get in on this gig, you know. You can get free welfare money and food stamps, and you can draw our comics, you know. Uh, I mean, I was, that was the same in our, I was living in New Orleans, and we had a, have a very strong comics community, and S. Clay Wilson would come and visit with us. Uh, Tony Millionaire showed us the fall walk, which shouldn't be described. Uh, but uh, the one cartoonist I know who uh, escaped, got bigger than that scene, um, I will not mention his name, uh, but he... What he was sounds like, Ramsworth? No, okay. Josh Simmons 
is uh, did, did the comic strip Happy, did uh, worked for Top Shelf Productions. He's very good, it's very twisted stuff. Uh, and he was the only one doing comics full time. I was like, how are you doing this? Mm -hmm. And I bugged him and I bugged him and he had had, he got hit by a car. And this was compensation, insurance compensation. And that's what he, he was living on nothing and in New Orleans at the time you could afford to. And that was his effective way of art school. Yes, and Dan Klaus, not, not Dan Klaus, uh, uh, who's the guy? Chris, Chris Ware, Chris Ware. Actually, Dan Klaus too, I think. I think maybe both of them were living with their grandparents, their respective grandparents, first few years they were doing comics. You know, that's one thing. You can not sell out if you are subsidized, you know. Uh, then again, what is what is what is all this? What is selling out? You know, Bill Griffith uh, peddled several scripts uh, of Zippy the Pinhead to Hollywood. I mean, is that selling out? You know, if uh, if the movie well, if the movie makes it to screen with his vision intact, I guess it's not. You know, uh, Harvey Pekar, I didn't think sold out when they made the American Splendor movie because it was true. It was true to uh, their vision. Yes. Um, Harvey said or admitted in an interview to me that he, uh, if it weren't for that movie, they wouldn't have been able to move on to their next projects. Uh -huh. So yeah. it saved his butt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Th th you know, there's, there's that. I don't know. And, uh, and afterwards, uh, it was a year or so after that movie came out, uh, when I was attending the University of Florida, the local film society and school invited him down there. He got he got paid for that. He gave a great speech, but it was about comics. And they were less than satisfied, but it really, I'm glad it worked out for him. And I had a great time. I'd like to open this up to people in the audience. You know, what is selling out? I mean, if you're starving, does it even, is it even an issue if you take a paying job that's not uh, say a commercial art job that's not quite the type of thing you do on your own, but I mean, is it even an issue? Uh, no. No, okay. <laughs> Straight up, no. Any, anybody, anybody would argue it is. No? Okay. <laughs> I've, learned, I've learned to be very, very mercenary. And in fact, even though I have another uh, project lined up, I, I just finished a uh, book that I've been working on for a couple of years now. In fact, there's a gallery out on the uh, floor, if anyone wants to come see my artwork. Okay. But uh, either way, I just finished up with this um, this book that was a paying gig, where I was working with a writer and he was paying me for finished pages. I just finished it like a month ago, and I've got another one lined up. But as soon as you said like I'm looking for artists, my ears totally perked up. I'm like, right. <laughs> well, um, here are my rates. Um, <laughs> And if you have some contact info, I'd certainly like to take it. Absolutely. I'm not kidding. I'm not. No, I'm not. Well, one of the reasons I'm here this weekend. I'd like, make money by drawing stuff. What do you want drawn? I mean, it's, it's, seriously, it's close enough to my field of passion. Yeah, even if it's not a story I wrote or a story that you know grabs my interest, I'll make it grab my interest and make it look good because that's my artwork out there. People are still looking at that. Well, but see, and, and that's, that's what interests me about this because as I look around, my, you know, my, my beginning to write scripts only happened about a year ago. Um, I always wrote stories and stuff, and then suddenly I realized that like, all the stories I really wanted to write, suddenly, I mean, I love comics all the time, but it never occurred to me to write one for some reason. And suddenly I realized, oh, these are comics. You know, and, and so I began writing them. And because my, you know, my real interest is in the independence, and because of being a pretty hardcore Dave Sim fan, the the idea of, of keeping control of it and self-publishing is pretty important to me. Right. So the idea of buying your pages or or any artist's pages outright and then owning it and then moving forward, right. which does seem the simple thing to do at the sort of level I'm operating at, which is to say, here, right. I don't, I don't um, is, it, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll try to finish up real quick, is, is sort of, doesn't sit well with me. Mm -hmm. Ideally, I'd like, you know, 
love to run across somebody who liked the script so much they really wanted to draw them and they wanted to be a 50-50 partner in, in the project. Even if, even if they didn't have money to fund the project, you know, you get your cut it, you know, well, yeah. but it's, if, there's, if there's money made, then you well, get yeah, it. There's like, not enough time in the world, though. Uh, I, right. I would love to do that when I come across people with good stories, but it's either do my own work, uh, which pays very little, or work with someone else's dream and idea, and I have to politely say no. Uh, I just don't have the energy because I, I put so much into it doing a comic story. Well, the trap is I've never had, while well, I've been working on this project, time to do my own stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's there's either one or the other. There's another conflict. Uh, I'm going to toss this to you first. <laughs> My outline this question, and then the audience, I'll toss it out to them. Uh, I don't know what anybody's interests are in the room. Well, you just mentioned Dave Sim, that gives me some idea. And, and Michael, I know, so I know some idea. But uh, this is, a, I'm going to start with you first. If you were offered a chance to draw Spider-Man for a Marvel comic, would you take it? Dave Sim, in his guide to self-publishing, said, uh, if somebody offers you uh, Spawn versus the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles versus <laughs> uh, the X-Men versus whatever, and throws this huge, huge wad of cash at you, take it and use the money to fund your own uh, project. Uh, does anybody else have anything to add? Maybe that was Dave Sim. I didn't say that was my reaction. Well, that's that, pretty good. It was, uh, <laughs> and I, I, I said, hold right your I was doing covers for IDW. Well, yeah. a lot of times, that, that is actually the business model for a lot of cartoonists. Yeah. And it's kind of like what I call the Martin Scorsese model. And then yeah. you do a movie for the, for the Hollywood mainstream, and then yeah. you do your own yeah. personal movie. Yeah. You use yeah. the money for that to fund your own You use money from something else to fund what you're doing. Does everybody in the room know who Jules Pfeiffer is? Uh, you know, cartoonist, uh, famous for doing his neurotic type characters uh, back in the 50s. He did two things where he would use money from somewhere else to fund what he was doing, or he would he would shift things around. He would take art jobs, art studio jobs, back in the 1950s. And he, he said he described it as getting a government writing grant. Uh, I'll tell you how this worked. He'd take art studio jobs, some cheesy animation studios like Terry Toons, he, these kind of places. He would go and he would put in six months there, and then after six months, he would do things like. He wasn't trying to hide this. He would slip out in the early afternoon and go to a movie, and he wouldn't come back for the rest of the day. If that didn't get enough attention, then he'd go out to that movie, say, 11, 11 o'clock a.m. If that didn't work, 10. He kept doing this until he got fired. He had his six months in, so he knew that he was trying to get them to fire him so he could collect unemployment and spend the money time on his own projects. So he said that was his, he did this several times. This was his way of getting a government writing grant. And uh, I thought that was very good. But he's always thinking of the angles, I mean, or so he says now. <laughs> he worked for the Village Voice, uh, you know, very influential newspaper in New York for many, many decades, starting in the 1950s. For the first three or four years, he had a weekly comic strip in there. And he was getting paid absolutely nothing. But he says part of his game plan was he lived in New York and he wanted to be famous. So this was part of his plan. He got in the New Yorker. People started seeing his work. After a few years, he started doing collections of that work in book form. And he had the audience that had been seeing his work every week. Uh, you know, so it's, it's like, you know, was he selling out, taking the jobs he had no interest in? No, because that funded his other thing, was he being a fool for doing this thing for years and years with no pay? Well, he had other jobs at the time, so no, you know, he didn't. But it's like, you have to think that way, you know, it's like, as an artist, what in the end result do you want? How do you get there? Uh, I guess I didn't get very far with my selling out question. When I lived, well, you when, when, when I lived in Seattle, I must have had some eccentric friends. I was doing a, a damn indie comic, and the guy said, I don't know, Bruce. 
it seems like you're coasting there, you're going to lose your street cred. And it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, among the 30 pe people at Sutton, well, go ahead. Oh, well, you mentioned, um, oh, mine just went like Dan Klaus. And I never heard of him or 8-Ball until the, uh, the movie came out mm -hmm. for Ghost World. And then I read that, so by the time Our School Confidential was adapted into a movie, and once again, I never heard of that until and, and again, he and that was the Swagoff also Gary did Swagoff, that. Robert Trump's welfare case worker, see how uh, that's Also worked. directed that. Right, and right. I wouldn't know who Klaus is if it wasn't having seen so when you, World. So when you were younger, you weren't going into comic book shops then? I was going into the wrong comic book shop. Oh, right? okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, keep in mind, I, can't, I was coming page in the 90s when Spawn versus the Tyrannosaurus versus the Ninja Turtles versus the Robots versus the Martians was the norm. That was everywhere. Right, right. That's, uh, and that's when um, I stopped, when I left high school, I stopped drawing. Hmm. I didn't have an art teacher, I never found one, and I just stopped and it was, the Chrome documentary came out, and at the same week, the only time I've ever seen a classified ad wanted artist was for a tattooing apprentice in town. Must have three recent examples of work. I was like, I did that, started drawing again, and since the apprenticeship didn't work out, got a job do, working offshore on the oil boats. Wow. You've got, you do your entire job, I was a deckhand, you do your entire job in three hours on a 12 hour shift, you're away at sea for a month, and you are a funded artist. Kind of. It worked. You were a funded artist on the drilling rig? Uh, running men and supplies back and forth okay. to the drilling rig, yes. But it was funding your art? Yes. And yeah. when I got back, uh, I found that somebody I had sent my comics to had put out a book with all my work in it and said, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> so they did that for you? Yes, I got a, a, a letter and a check in the mail that said, uh, I named it Trent Reznor once my ass. Uh, I hope you don't mind. I use all your comics. Uh, here's your copies. And we made a check for it. It's a business. What? <laughs> Not a business model to uh, put for <laughs> I'd like to tackle something else because this is, I specifically remember we were talking about this, what is talent? We did yeah. Well, I mean, what, what is it? You know, if you're an artist, you run into this. If somebody draws very well at a young age, and when I was in grade school, the thing was, can you draw a horse? No, this is true. Like the Highlights magazine and all, they'd have little jokes and things the readers would send in, and there'd be drawings in there. And boy, it's like eight years old. And th this horse looked like it was drawn by, you know, who, Durer or who, any of these, you know, Rembrandt. It's like, we, we weren't quite sure that that eight-year-old person with the name attached <laughs> actually drew, but that was the standard, you know, just saying this, this kind of thing. And we all said, well, that's because that person had talent. So, I don't know, uh, tied into what is talent, there's this, also this idea. Some people say, you have to be drawing you have to be born drawing or you're never going to make it. Now, is that true? At least, okay, you say no. Jack Kirby said that anybody can draw. Anybody can draw? And Jack Kirby said anybody can draw. All they have to do is want to and start practicing and, and learn. Now, is that true? I believe that's true. I agree. You agree? I don't. Can anybody don't. play guitar? Huh? Can anybody play guitar? Yes, they try. Well, if you have a, if you have a, loose, a loose definition of uh, uh, Guitar. Exactly yeah. the same. Oh, exactly the oh, same. Oh, okay. Everybody can learn to draw. Everybody can learn to do cartoons. But are they any good? I think does the muse whisper to people who are deaf? Michael <laughs> <laughs> keyed into it though when, does when you were referencing Kirby. I, I think it was you have to have the interest in it. Like using your guitar metaphor. Sure. True. I mean, I'm just not interested in playing music. And there's going to be different levels of accomplishment, of course. Right. Not everybody's going to be Richie Blackmore. Right. But guitars. <laughs> does the. What was that? Does the, I should have written that down. <laughs> I think it's on tape. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> All these things have such physical components to them, though, in that. Oh, well, of course they do. But a guitar, or you know, an artist with a brush on a canvas or a pencil on paper. Yes. Um, like, like for instance, you know, when I'm writing a script, I see a page, I see the layout, I uh -huh. see the figures, I see it all in my mind. 
I cannot translate it. I put the pen in my hand, I put pen to paper, and, and I come up with some semblance, or barely a semblance, of, of what's in my head. And it's, and it's interesting that you mentioned guitar, because I basically had the same experience with guitar. I can pick up a guitar, I can tune a guitar by ear, and, and, and I know the chords, but I can't make my physical body do the right thing. You just have to practice more. Uh, and, 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 and I'll give you that. That, that is certainly a possibility and, and, and something that would work perhaps for some people. I, I do have to take it on faith that I, I gave it a pretty good shot. As a comic, there might be copies here on the show floor. I'm not sure, but he has a comic called "Why I'm Not Musical," and right. apparently right. he got into comics right. because he wanted to play guitar right. and just couldn't do it, so he started drawing instead. You had a comment? Well, we're coming to a consensus, I think, here that the arts are all connected, uh -huh. and uh, underpinning that, I would have to say, to find your own voice, quote unquote in any art form, it, you have to be fearless. You know, motivation for a particular art form might help, but observe all art forms, see how they interconnect. Uh, storyboard, uh, if you don't like how you draw, practice, have somebody else draw, but don't be afraid of experimenting. If you don't want to learn guitar chords, I can't read music, but I'll play a banjo as if it were a sitar. And I'm having fun. Right, right. So don't forget the fun factor and try to eliminate the fear factor. Yeah, yeah, there's no And then you will, you will show up. I was, was going to say, I think it's a, in, art, it's very point. in art, and, and especially cartooning, I think there's a little more leeway than in playing the guitar. Yes and no. Yes and no, okay. Mm -hmm. Would you say Jimi Hendrix was a great guitarist? Yeah. Did he play conventional? What about Fred? No, I'm not, I'm not talking about conventional. Actually, actually, Jimi Hendrix is a good example of a multi-talented person. I lived in Seattle and I met people that uh, went to school with him. And if you go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you will see not only Jimi Hendrix's guitars, you hear his music, you will see he was, a, he was a good cartoonist and a really great painter in his high school days. He was winning art awards. Yeah. And I mean, he could do so many different things. It's like, uh, you know, damn, sparks flew off that guy. He was, you know, he was, he was all about creativity. Uh, it's one of these things, you know, and, and this is not unusual. When Justin Green was in college, well, art school, Rhode Island School of Design, his roommate was a guy who later became well-known comedian and TV and movie guy, Martin Mall. That was his roommate. He said at the time, you know, Martin Mall was studying art, but he's also a really, really good guitar player. And Justin knew this guy was just so highly creative that he was going to make it somewhere, you know. And he started out, you know, with a series of musical type comedy albums where he'd make fun of the carpenter and other deserving figures. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, that's, that's just the point. I think as a creative person, you, you don't want to limit yourself. Justin Green's an excellent example if you want to talk about art and commerce. Does Let, that, everyone look. here know who Justin Green is? Oh, oh. Uh, well, you, take, you tell a little and I'll tell. He invented the mini comic, basically. And he invented the autobiographical comic. Uh, his 1973 uh, work, uh, Binky Brown Meets the Holy Virgin Mary, was a masterpiece of blasphemy, <laughs> self confession, and OCD before it had a name. And and also was, his inspiration for Art Spiegelman's mouth, which he has said. Art says as often as he possibly yes, can. Yes. Uh, Justin is my partner on my webcomic, uh, Pen Games. He does his own work, I do my work. But the man is so bad at self-promotion that when we met, had our, to set up, little you know, what are we going to do together, he said, have you checked out my blog yet? And I said, no, I Googled you, I didn't find anything. And he's like, oh, I don't put my name on it. This is Justin Green. How could you find it? He, he, you know, he's the velvet underground of cartooning. Every, you know, he only sold X number of copies, but everybody else went on to be a famous cartoonist. So, also, also he, in his heyday, though, this, this comic, Binky Brown meets the Holy Virgin Mary, 
it all, not only started off autobiographical comments, even though it was only about 25 some pages, I think it was the first graphic novel, really. And he was getting fan letters from people like, well, there's this Italian film director who was very popular in the 60s and 70s named Federico Fellini. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of him, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Poor old Justin, I guess he's, uh, you know, that, that's just one of those things, yes. When I, when I met him, you know, I'd moved, I'd been back in Cincinnati just a few months, it seemed like, and actually I have to tell the story. I was at this art gallery, and there was a uh, display on the wall, Justin Green and Carol Tyler, and I just couldn't believe it, because I've been fans of both their work forever, you know, and I said to the gallery, I don't know, how did you get them? How did you manage to get them? And he said, oh, they live in town, you know. This is Cincinnati, Ohio. Mayberry on the Ohio River, you know. <laughs> the, the arts are not thought too highly of, so uh, this is just the way it goes. And so I tracked Justin down. He was working at the time doing a weekly, a uh, monthly comic strip for this magazine called Signs of the Times. And uh, I tracked him down through that, and we were having like a monthly get-together of cartoonists, and I invited him over, and I don't know, to me, because I was around for Binky Brown, meeting him was like akin to meeting John Lennon or somebody, you know, it's like, it's like, but he's the most, like you said, he's the most humble guy. He, he is, uh, he's a world famous cartoonist, but he acts like a guy that still just has a few mini comics on his strangers. And doesn't make, doesn't do anything to promote himself doesn't make a living from his cartoon. When, when the Comics Journal had the 100 greatest cartoonists, or comic, they had, they had the 100 greatest comics of the 20th century, he was in there, like, in the, I think the top 10. You know, he, yeah, he's, he's highly regarded, but... He's got a straight job. Huh? He's got a straight job. Plans to go along with it, or, or no. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was, uh, he was, he was a hand sign painter, fantastic hand sign painter, but then along came Wild Sign. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess I guess uh, also, you know, more on this topic, I should contrast him. They both started in underground comics, but you have Art Spiegelman, who I think of as a great example of somebody who's remained true to his commercial vision and at the same time has actually made a pretty good living at it. In New York you know, in New York City, Art Spiegelman is a local celebrity. You know, people know the name Art Spiegelman, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, first was Mouse, and then Mouse 2, and then uh, he put them together, what, uh, a, a set and a slipcase, and then he had, I don't know what he called it, but he had the recordings of his father from when he was researching the book, Meta Mouse, yeah. And, uh, I heard Art Spiegelman speak in Seattle. It was this Jewish uh, organization that brought him in. It was in the church. My wife went with me, and she said, I didn't think he'd be interesting at all. Just talk about it. But no. He reached out to the audience, and it was mostly older Jewish people who had no idea of underground comics or comic books or anything. In fact, one of them said to the other, my word, look at all the young people that have come to see him. I, I want, it's good to know that the younger people have such an interest in the Holocaust. And, you know, <laughs> completely oblivious that he, he'd had a career before that. But you contrast those two. Or even, uh, this is a tale out of school, but you know, uh, Carol told me this. They were still living out in California and Terry's wife off was on location filming the Crumb documentary and Justin was up a up, up on a ladder, hanging a sign on the side of a building. <laughs> what? Who do I do? I never yes, heard this. Yes, yes, and and uh, I guess Carol saw said, you know, come over here. You know, Terry, can't you knock off for a while? Come over. So you know, just. You know, but I mean, the two of them are so far apart. Robert Crumb, of course, was the. You know, he's an international cartoonist, celebrity, and now his work is in fine arts collections all around the world. I mean, my God, he lives in this French villa. The, the, the price was a few of his sketchbooks. Uh, and as we said before, Art Crumb does not sell out. So uh, he, managed, he managed to do it somehow. 
How does that apply to uh, to people in the audience? I mean, are, 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 are they from Yeah. How, well, I, I mean, know. was it uh, keep on trucking? Was it uh, Fritz the Cat? Like, what thing was it that made him go from underground, like people within the scene know about him, to being uh, something everybody knows well, about today? Uh, keep on trucking was used without his permission. Here's well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, Robert Crumb published this comic book called Zap Comics, and people saw it, and people's heads blew up. That's basically what happened. People's heads blew up. No, Robert Crumb was living in San Francisco, and he was a big celebrity, because everybody thought Zap Comics was the coolest thing. I mean, R. Crumb was never so much down with the hippies himself, personally, but, you know, he was buddies with Janis Joplin, and well, you said I'm good at dropping the name, so here's the go. I had, I had dinner with Dennis Kitchen one time, and he said he was there at the Fillmore West in San Francisco, and Janis Joplin, big brother in the holding company, were up there, and he said, you know, Janis Joplin said from the stage, guess what, everybody? Our Crumb is doing the cover of our next album. And the crowd cheered, you know? How did our Crumb become our Crumb? He just did. Uh, things spearheaded. He, created a character called Fritz the Cat. There was a very bad animated cartoon made about Fritz the Cat, but he got a little pile of money from him. He didn't even want to sign the release form. So he went out and hid in the woods when Ralph Bakshi came knocking on the door. His, his ex-wife, his first wife, ended up signing, you know, they had a kid at home, still living on welfare, things were tight. Uh, I don't know, just his work, I think, Art Crumb's work reached so many people. It's, it's like trying to describe Beatlemania if you weren't there in 1964. You know, it's just something happened and it changed the world. And that was him. So many people saw his work, and they responded by drawing comic books. This is it. This is what I want to do. Sometimes they drew in his exact same style, which wasn't good. Uh, and I, there, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. If, uh, one thing about Crumb is that is completely relevant to space, the convention, is that what his biggest, uh, one of the biggest distribu distributors, as far as I'm aware, you can correct me, of underground comics were the head shops. They, that is no longer a distribution place that people go and pick up a pipe and some comics. The comic shops had their back. praise, they're gone. What are we doing if, you know, if you're here and you're a small cartoonist, what is your option for distribution? Is it all about being on the web and uh, tumbling? <laughs> I, that is the only thing that's actually gotten me more followers is Tumblr, mm -hmm. Facebook. I reach 100 people and I get more visits to my site, but it doesn't actually reach beyond that. There aren't more people friendly. Right. Well, 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 you know, well, let's throw out some ideas. That was then, this is now. A motto I've seen that works for some is, uh, there's a cartoonist named Phil Folio. You know, he has a girl genius. I don't know if anybody's seen this thing. It's comics, you know. He'll post whole stories, like a 20-page story online. People see it, they like it, and then they come back and they buy the book collection. They want, they want the physical object. You have to, it's always been the same thing. In my day with mini comics, it's always been the same thing. You have to get your work seen. Mm -hmm. uh, I taught a class called Cartooning Careers at the University of Washington for like seven years. And the thing I would always say to the class is, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, did it actually make a sound? You know, and that's your career as a cartoonist. You could be the greatest cartoonist but if nobody hears you, <laughs> did you actually make a sound? Well, well the, 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 that goes back to uh, you know to the artist having to self promote. In in the age of the, they do. Uh, what, they do. What, here, here's a uh, axe cop. Anyone familiar yeah. with axe cop? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So so you know the story behind axe cop, or most of you do anyway. Uh, but can you give it to, uh, back to me in one second. I, I can't. Okay. Give us the, give us the okay. pitch. Um, unsuccessful artist has a little brother who he plays with. Like the one kid's 28, or the dude's like 25, 28, or whatever, and then his kid is, and his half brother is five. Right. They play together for fun. He drew up some comics based on his young, much younger brother's stories. Crazy stuff. It's not one sentence, sorry. 
but he puts it online just for fun. He gets hits. It goes, it, you know, I hate to use the word viral, but it goes viral. Blah, 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 blah. Before long, he's putting together, people are wanting to buy things. So he's having to do more. And now he spends his time, and this, this literally was just, just him. Dark Horse came to him to publish the first set in a, in a small graphic novel, you know, maybe 80, 100 pages. Um, they're, they're great comics because they're completely stream of consciousness from a, from a five-year-old or kids like maybe eight and a half are still doing it. But uh, an entire career was born from this. Yes, yes. But he had to have it out there. Right. He had to have it out now. You know, he, he was just sort of lucky. He wasn't trying to sell this. He was trying to do his other work. That's rule. That's rule number one. You have yeah. to have it out there. But um, but you have to, was, but you, you have to have it seen. But 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 he's lucky. What what you're what you're seeing is a lot of people. You can go out on the web and you can look around at people's tumblers and you can see a lot of amazing work, um, even full stories. But nobody's looking at it. The internet's a huge well, place. I, I sort of I sort of characterize it like the outdoor bazaar, you know, in the, the Arabian town or whatever, where you have all the peddlers and they're all trying to get your attention. That's right. And there's so many. So step outside the store. Right? Yeah, that's right. Right. That's right. right. That's right. That's right. So that that is. But but it's always it's always been that way. Even when even when things supposedly were good for cartoons, it's always been that way. And it's always been a case of very little room at the top, as they say, you know, the people that are making the great income. Uh, right now, we live in lousy times for cartoonists, you could say. You know, comic book shops, most of them have rolled over and died about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, the newspaper on paper, the newspaper on paper, which was a place where cartoonists could make a living, is dying. I, I had a question. Uh, yes. Based on what you were saying, um, I had somebody come by my table today, and this year I don't have my comics out. I've got prints, and he was enjoying them. He was flipping through the portfolio, got to a particular one, and took out his phone to take a couple snapshots of it. And I stopped. I'm like, do I want this to happen or do I not want this to happen? Is this promotion you, or you might I totally want it to happen? I, I, I just say, saw I say you exactly might that I totally wanted to happen, and it's like, and I saw him at the table sharing with his friends. So well, let's let's, let's let's throw good. that out. Let's throw that out. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think that that right now you have to use like every means at your disposal. So you know, Tumblr, or Twitter, or Facebook, you have to use all that, and I do I do use all that. But I think also at the very minimum you have to put your stuff online for free so that people can read it. Yeah. Because because you know all the people that I've all the cartoonists that I've talked to agree yeah. that if they put their stuff on top on for free online people read it and then they want to buy the physical book. We have a we have a but, comment over here. Tom. A really good example of that. Um, if you're not reading home stuff, you're home stuff. Um, it's I on know. a website called MSP Adventures. Yeah, my daughter loves it. She it's, loves home stuff. It's oh, yeah. crazy. Like the um, the fan base is probably in the millions, but um, including like, Canada. Um, but it's this completely um, self-sustainable site. Does it, does uh, does it thrive because the um, like is there a forum? Are the people talking about it? It originally started as um, as a forum comic. Um, yes. The Choose Your Own Adventure sort of thing. Um, that he was like, all right, so we're just gonna start drawing out the um, like, all right, so there's a point where we know what happens, and then you click on the link, and it's the next you know the next panel, and. He's been updating since then. Um, he's got several different comics. Um, Problem Sleuth is also another popular one. It's completed. Um, but the Normal is the, the really big one. I wouldn't have known anything about it if it had not been for um, my friends online. So it's called Homestock? Homestock. Yeah. Homestock. And this is not unfamiliar. This is spread. You know about this. Yeah, I've read the whole thing. I've read well, well, everything that he had posted. Did you also uh, get it passed on to you by somebody online? Um, yes. Uh, it was not a comment site, but, you know, just discussing things. But I, I guess that's a good point, too. It's like, like, you know, just people that you meet online, and it's like they like the kind of stuff that you like, and they mm -hmm. suggest something. Watch I found, it out. I, found that my, uh, I did not expect this, but when I had the uh, a gallery show two months ago, my largest audience, I didn't, I couldn't really read, know who I was reaching, 
my largest audience was women between the ages of 50 and 60. That was it. And so I learned did, more. To what do you attribute this demographic? I don't know. Oh, you don't know? I know. I'm, I'm, huh. I'm thrilled. That, that's uh, curious. But uh, yeah. that was a surprise. That's curious. You know, it's, it's like, uh, I'd say as an artist, it, you know, it's like, if you're doing something that's just uh, referential to 1960s comic books or 1990s image comics or something, well, you're limiting your audience to those. Yeah. Because I'm no. not interested. If that's yeah. what you're doing. Right, right. right. If, you, if you're doing something that takes on something out of the larger world that more people are interested in, uh, maybe you've got something. Two of my friends from Open Seattle just published a book, a graphic novel, uh, late last year, called Don't Forget the Song. It came out from Abrams, a big publisher. It's about the Carter family. They were the they were the sort of founders of country music, and uh, uh, quite a story it is. It's like there's all sorts of, you know, heartbreak and and uh, just family strains and uh, highly dramatic. It's a highly dramatic life. What's the name of that again? Uh, don't forget this song. You can also go on their blog. Don't forget this blog and find <laughs> out what's going on. At Christmas time, at the end of the year, it was the second best-selling country music book on Amazon.com right after, I think, uh, some Kenny Rogers book. Or there might have been a few weeks when it was ahead of it. I mean, it, it uh, and of course, the, the people that are interested in that are, it's not just comics fans, there's some comics fans there, but mostly it's country, country, country music fans. Anybody that's ever heard of Johnny Cash? Well, Johnny Cash was married to June Carter from the Carter family. Well, so, so said Carter family was like, you mean Billy and Jimmy? I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. This is, this is A.P. Carter, who uh, would travel around the country. He called himself a song catcher. He would listen to people's old songs, and he would transcribe them and rework them and put them, you know, get them recorded. He was a black musician he was working with, and here again, it's just, it's just this conflict. He wanted to be, you know, fair with the guy and give this guy credit and give this guy a share of the money because it was his song. The music publisher, the, the record company, said, no, AP, just your name's going on this. The other guy, well, that's your problem, you know, and uh, we can't really pay. So AP would pay the guy out of his own pocket. You know, it's, it's this kind of, it's this kind of, that was art running up smack dab against commerce and getting a little bruised by it. It's not that I'm, I'm still jumping off of the That's fine. Let's, uh, <laughs> that's fine. The idea of selling out. Yes. Yes. <laughs> if, you're, uh, if you're actually thinking about what your audience wants, it's like um, not everyone's in it, interested in image comics and the history thereof. I'm not interested in it. But uh, <laughs> if that was the only thing I was interested in, yes. then that would be the only way I could be true to my muse, and I must put out that particular work, and I'd have yes. a reader base that was yes. perhaps intense and small. Yes. Comics is a medium. Yes. It's not that's a exactly, particular type that's of story. That's exactly right. I, I just bought, and I love it. it it's a manga, and what's it about? It's about food. It's the mo one of the most popular comics in Japan. It sold like 34 million copies all around the world. It translated in I don't know how many languages. And it's just this very, very thin storyline. And they go around and they talk about what makes great food. OK? Well, that's, that's, that's the great thing about and comics. You want to try and reach out to more people? People food. read about <laughs> what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. People are interested in food. Mm -hmm. People are interested in I don't know. People are interested in relationships. People are Rel interested relationships. in family. Relationships, right? Wasn't right. the way Faulkner said, you know, all great literature comes from the human heart in conflict with itself? I mean, I mean that is the, that's, wow. that's everywhere that's in the good. Bible and every. I mean, that is, you know, you, you get that. Yeah, everybody can relate. Yeah, if you pick a topic, a, pro a topic that everybody can relate to and identify with, I think you're going to get some readers. You know, if somebody reads a comic you've done and they say, that's true. I've been, as a, just, it's just a personal experiment, and I read all different types of comics, mm -hmm. and I take 
various comics around and I show them to people who never read comics. Um, my mother, friends of my mother, you know, so these are 60 year old women, they, but they read. That's the important thing. Yes. They like to read stories. They like them. You can't, I don't think, uh, it actually, there is apparently a small barrier to learning to read a comic book. Um, it's actually, it's a, language. It's, it's a language. So the paneling has to be, you can't do crazy paneling or anything. But they're willing to read about stuff that they're interested in. I think anybody would be. Um, I, my mother is a fan of Bone. My mother reads manga, that's the, the rom some of the romance manga. But she's a reader. And that was the connection, that was the feeding. And her son's an artist, but. Yeah. <laughs> but that took away the prejudice against the form. Mm -hmm. That's it. It wasn't uh, what I do is not her necessarily chosen subject matter. But right. there is a resistance against uh, comics if you don't put something interesting in front of something. I guess that's a, that, that's a curious thing. The commercial comic book world is, yeah, they're narrow casting. I mean, they made all these movies of the Marvel superheroes and whatnot that have made, you know, had millions and millions of viewers, but it had not translated and saw millions and millions of comics. So they, they've got something, they've got an idea that appeals to people in one form, but that form is not really comics. But, you know, Marvel and DC are resistant to, most of things. I mean, there's some exceptions. These print sales are up in the past couple of years. Even, the di even as digital sales are up, print sales are up. I mean, it's not That's cool. We're not talking like, you know, I mean, there, digits, there's but exceptions we're up. that prove the rule. DC Comics did publish some Harvey P. Carr stuff later on. Uh, well, throw up an idea here yeah. for everybody sitting here, for you guys over there. I, I, I'm wondering, like, if the term selling out only applies to either when you break pattern away from your chosen medium, like uh, for example, Flintstones vitamins. Yeah, Flintstones was a cartoon <laughs> show, and then when you start using it to sell like chewable vitamins, you sold out. Uh, that was my favorite. Or, or the other one I thought was like people call you sell when you do something terrible after you've already become popular and famous and well-renowned and respected for your work, and then you make something that's utter garbage. My example. The Phantom Menace. <laughs> people yeah, call Lucas yeah. a sellout. I think he sold out with Return of the Jedi, yeah, personally. Yeah, but people yeah. call him a sellout after those movies. Well, this yeah. brings to mind, there is a cliche, especially in the alternative rock field, the punk rock field, the bands. You know, uh, they are artistic geniuses when they have an audience of 500 people. When they start to have an audience of thousands of people, then all of a sudden, the band itself could not have done anything different. They could be still pursuing the vision, mm -hmm. but to some, the original fans that get possessed say, "Well, they sold out." Right. Yeah. But, but, but that, There's that's nothing the, wrong with money, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, we're just getting started. <laughs> 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 and, and plus, uh, that's the that's the difference between the perception of someone selling out and whether that person thinks they've sold out. You know, the, the, the band I like when no one knew about them are sellouts when everyone else likes them too. That, that's exactly the that's, right? that's exactly, I mean, right. and for most people, that's exactly the thing. thing. As, as, but, an artist, as an artist, though, can you worry about that? I mean, that, right. I mean, maybe, I mean, you know, Nirvana made Nevermind in like 14 days or whatever. And, no uh, and then Kurt Cobain hated and, it after and, it became and popular. No one, no one expected it to do anything. I, I just and, saw. And, and I just saw a, a, uh, Bob Corby doing the we got uh, we, we have to we have to fit in a few commercials here for aluminum siding and, uh, <laughs> and he's all like, oh, he's it it <laughs> <laughs> I don't know any any, any final statement? Uh, I think we have wrapped this. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming Thank out. You. We appreciate it.